Looks like it's time to start back up. Uh, so, welcome back from afternoon tea. Hope you all had a scone or whatever else they had out there. I only grabbed scones. I didn't even look at anything else. Um, so, we're into our final uh, final uh, group of sessions for the day. Uh, so, you know, it's almost over. But we've got some great stuff coming up. Uh, so, first up, we have Ender, who's going to be giving us a bit of a retrospective look at the eTech engine. Uh, engines, rather, there's more than one. Uh, so, please join me in thanking Ender. Thank you very much. All right, so I hope everyone's had a great day. So let's get on with it. So mainly today, uh, well, firstly, who am I? I'm Ender. I'm a systems administrator by day, and by night I occasionally put on my Indiana Jones hat and go digging around in old software. Um, I used to be a co-lead of the Scum VM project, emulating all the old LucasArts stuff. So that was my 2D stuff. But before that, I was doing 3D with the, the Quake engine. I was doing Quake mods from 97-ish onwards. And uh, 99 to 2006, I ran a site called Quake Source which was a set of forums, tutorial site for people wanting to do engine development with the idtech engines. <clears throat> so, what is idtech? Um, idtech is a family of engines developed by ID Software and probably spawned the first real modding scene. You know, people had maps, they had total conversions, they had lots of things. And for quite a while, in fact, the industry standard if you're applying for a games development job was, well, where's your Quake maps? Where's your Doom maps? What did you do? Um, it was heavily licensed and used by many, many games, and it was also the first commercial production FPS engine to be released open source under the GPL, which is fantastic. Why am I talking about this? Now, I like talking about old things, you know, archaeology, the, the things we've, places we've been are usually the places we're going. So I come up with this, the, the conference theme is a little bit of history repeating, and I also like to use this very sort of uh, simplistic metaphor of everything's a circle. Where we've been is usually where we're going. 640K is enough for everyone. Minimum system requirements, 8 gig of RAM. And now you're trying to do something on a console, you've got one meg. Um, you know, everyone's logging into a mainframe, V22 terminals. Everyone has a PC on the desktop. Everything's in the cloud, thin client. Pretty much where we've went is where we're going. Adventure games are awesome, adventure games are dead, adventure games are awesome. <laughs> now, I'm not an Inkscape genius, so I'm going to switch to a couple of little um, maps here that someone else has done. So the first one is a... Creative Commons one. This is a history of FPS, FPS engines. It's under Creative Commons from Wikipedia. Someone's done a lot of work doing this chart. So you can see here, you know, we started out with Doom. Now, Doom was ID Tech 1. A um, lot of stuff been written about Doom, so I'm not going to talk too much about that today. Uh, I really recommend Masters of Doom, the book. It's really awesome. It talks about the sort of development cycle of Doom. Doom spawned Heretic, Hexen. Then we had Quake. Down here, by the way, we've got the build engine, Duke Nukem. Sort of the same time as Quake. Um, Quake was IdTech 2, and that was Quake and Quake 2, which spawned things like Sin, Half-Life, then we have Quake 3, IdTech 2, Return to Castle Wolfenstein, Star Trek Elite Force, a lot of the Star Trek games, Medal of Honor, Allied Assault was actually based off IdTech 3, Doom 3, Call of Duty, they're all separate engines over there, and then, you know, sort of Half-Life 2 source, all still continuing from that original, original tree. Now I've got a second tab up here. Um, so there were a lot of Quake engines. So we've got GeoQuake, which was the original, and these are all engines that have spawned from it. Quake World, which probably is the, what the gold standard in netcode, and a lot of things spawned from that. Um, continuing up, you've got Quake, you've got Quake 2, going into you know, all these other engines. There is a whole family of stuff based off this, this technology. Um, so, like I said, it spawned the modding scene. You know, you had Quake Total Conversions where people had taken the assets from Quake and replaced them with other assets. And these were things you would find in your news agents. You would find collections of Doom maps. You would find X-Men, the Ravagers of the Apocalypse, which, by the way, I found for $9 US on eBay this morning. Um, you know, hey, it's still got value. And, you know, these created basically a lot of industries. A lot of game developers from now spawned from doing Quake mods. Etc. Originally, I split this up into two things. I split this up into innovations and legacy. For time, I've sort of squished them both together. Um, so, you know, what sort of things did, did we come up with? IDTech 2, or Quake, was the very first engine to use BSP, or binary space petitioning, for maps. It also did some interesting things for performance, because we're talking about, you know, 486DX2s here. We're not talking about a lot of megahertz. 66 megahertz you can get away with? 
So I did a lot of things like pre-calculated visibility using PVS, pre-calculated light maps by pre-baking lighting textures. Uh, interestingly enough, this caused some interesting things. For example, when Tim Sweeney was doing Unreal Ed, he developed real-time BSPs because he thought that's what John Carmack was doing. He had no idea at the time that John was actually doing pre-calculated visibility sets and things like that. So, you know, he wanted to come up with the same technology that the competition had. And so he thought he did, but it actually sort of went the next step. So, you know, there's sort of also a um, pushing other people forward. IDTEC also came up with pretty much traditional FPS physics and innovations. Things like rocket jumps, gibbing. These are things that, you know, uh, future releases of IDTEC 2 actually changed the physics and got rid of rocket jumping. And that caused a massive backlash. Because these are evolutionary things. These are things that you actually don't know about when you're designing the game. These are things you only find out about when people play the game. It was also cross-platform, uh, thanks to both Dave Taylor and uh, Dave Zoid. I can't remember his last name at the moment. It had a scripting engine. Uh, it Tech 1 had triggers in maps. You could do some things, but you couldn't go and develop new weapons. You couldn't add you know, new gameplay features. You, you were pretty restricted in what you could do inside the mapping environment. But it Tech 2 had a full scripting engine. Originally, that was an interpreted thing called Quake C. Uh, I pretty much grew up learning to program with Quake C. It wasn't my first language, but it was the first language I felt like I did things with. That later switched to native code, which I'll talk about a bit later. Entities also had their own think cycles. Any entity could become the camera, which, you know, unlike in Tech 1, you're restricted player point of view. You could have random element up there become the camera, and this was a pretty massive innovation. And uh, it created Mashinima. Pretty much all Mashinima from, you know, then on spawned from id Tech 2. People were chopping up demos, people were doing custom code, custom entities and creating full on things. I worked on a three hour long uh, movie called Nahara, which was fully voiced, uh, written by a guy called Mindcrime. And it was a three hour long Mashinima done in the id Tech engine. Quake World introduced cutting edge net code. These are things that we're still doing today. Client side prediction server-side extrapolation. Um, basically, you know, it had dedicated multiplayer maps. It was the first, arguably, there's a bit of debate on this, the first game to have dedicated deathmatch maps. And, you know, again, it sort of comes, single player is the way to go. We'll put some IPX networking in Doom. No one's ever going to use that. LAN parties started, developed LAN parties. Um, so Quakewell developed, you know, that further, adding things like prediction to allow you to play on laggier connections and the sort of you know, stuff that you're looking at, looking at doing these days. Arguably, it started the engine wars. You know, looking back at that FPS engines map, you could see you've got some FPS engines, you know, there, and then Quake, Doom, Quake, and then poof, proliferation of people trying to emulate that. A lot of them licensed Quake. Uh, at the time, Quake was UPL. The Editech engine, you could license for a $10,000 US flat fee. So, you know, if people wanting to spawn, you know, new developers and new games, it was, you know, quite interesting. Um, an honourable mention to id Tech 3 here, which came up with something called the fast inverse square root. Now, when the code base was GPL, it was very interesting. It was very well commented. This is one of those functions. This spawned a, a Usenet thread, which went on for several months, actually. <laughs> Trying to figure out what this function does, it was faster than almost any other method of doing an inverse square root. But the code isn't particularly... Well, there's an evil floating you know, floating point hack there, then there's some magic, and it returns a number. Uh, I really recommend anyone interested in this read the Wikipedia page. We eventually tracked this down to being coming out of probably Silicon Graphics at the time. A lot of people attributed this to John Carmack. He said, no, I didn't write this. That's why the comment's there. I don't know how this works. <laughs> so, oh, comment, yes, this is the original comment from the Tech 3 code base. So he was as confused as the rest of us were. But this was black magic, you know, so that Wikipedia page sort of walks you through the whole history of this function. And I could do a talk on that alone, so I'm not going to. I'm sort of, you know, skimming across things. I've only got another, yeah. Ten-ish minutes. Ten-ish minutes. So I'm actually putting in right slides here. Um, John Carmack with IDTech also solicited community feedback. You know, this is one of those things where he knew what he had. Uh, id Software had done software licensing of their engines before. They tried to license the Commander Keen engine to a, a Podgy. 
our 3D realm. So that ended terribly for them because they took the code and they cloned it and developed their own engine. So for a while there, id Software said, we're never licensing an engine again. Thankfully, they changed their mind because, you know, we got all these wonderful new engines around. And uh, for people that remember the old days of Finger, he had a, his dot .plan file where he would frequently publish his progress on current development and, you know, what he was thinking about going forward. So in this one, he's considering dropping Quake C, which I loved, in favour of native DLLs, which is the way sort of went to the future and is the main reason we didn't get Half-Life on Linux for a decade. Um, there's a lot of issues involved with this. It's more efficient. 5 to 15% speed improvement. Considering at the time when you're doing pathfinding in id tech, you're, throwing, you're casting rays, waiting for a ray to hit something, and that's you know, your pathfinding, your logic finding. So doing that in native code would give you a massive performance boost. He, however, was aware that this would create some controversy. It would be non-portable. I am dreading the reaction to this from the Linux community. Game modifications would have to be carved separately for each target architecture. Uh, another line I like from this one is, there are security concerns, but I suppose to a world that embraces ActiveX, this really isn't an issue. <laughs> John Carmack is a very forward-thinking guy here. Um, he also had a strange mix of pride and shame when thinking about people that actually learnt to code from his little Quake C scripting language that he'd made for this engine. Uh, I, you know, the pride I go for, I wouldn't say shame. You know, we all knew it wasn't a real programming language, but we did what we could with it. In fact, some people went down to the fact of getting rid of the interpreter and figuring out his opcodes and writing Quake assembly. So, you know, never attribute to the community um, things that they can work around. So, he released the code GPL. He'd released IdTech 1 GPL, and that was awesome, but to be honest, you know, the indie development community at the time had already pretty much wrote their own engines that had those set of features. There wasn't nothing, there was nothing there that was technologically, you know, super compelling. Um, it Tech 2, however, the Quake engine, this was still being licensed at the time. So at the time he GPL'd the code, it was still making money licensing this to commercial developers. So we were actually getting to look at a commercial engine that was still in production. Not 15-year-old technology, not five-year-old technology, but still pretty current technology. So the community rapidly started building out features. Very first thing to do was figure out how to make the code compile because there was some middleware, some memory management stuff that had been ripped out for the GPL release. We started to develop tutorials. We added colored lighting. Uh, I spent two months making Half-Life 1 maps load because I figured if I can get the maps to load, surely the rest of it's gonna be a piece of cake. No. Um, as unfortunately with every GPL thing, I'm gonna talk a bit about people taking advantage. There was um, a commercial game, uh, Laser Arena, which we've discovered had stolen, oh, okay, nicer term, had cribbed code from tutorials on the site. Uh, you know, little strings on it, we could see error messages in our tutorials, and it's like, well, dude, this isn't very cool. Unfortunately, they had licensed the engine commercially from id, and it was sort of, you know, against id's um, business case to pursue one of their licensees for GPL infringement. So, you know, we had, we had some discussions with, the, with Todd uh, Hollistead and the guys at uh, Eddie, and they said, look, you know, they paid us lots of money. It's a small bit of code. Get over it. And we decided that with the advantages we were getting as a community for this thing, overweighed the benefits uh, or the, the negatives, I guess, of having the code taken. We did, however, go and retrofit licensing messages to every single page on the site after that because, you know, come on, dudes. Um, there was another case, however, where I was working on a project with, um, with a few other people who were much smarter than me, and we were trying to get around the problem of this. There are a number of people upset about the Quake 1 source release because it allowed cheating in existing games. So he knew that releasing the source code would create a whole bunch of cheating, and you know he knew that the mechanism really had nothing there to prevent cheating. Uh, he'd proposed a proposal to use a netcode proxy that sat between the game engine and the game server, did some encryption magic, sorted stuff out. Uh, he recommended that we speak to some crypto guys. Now, I joined a team with a bunch of crypto guys and we just we'd come up with some nice methods of doing sort of pre-shared uh, pre key negotiation, etc. Then another project came out and they came up with another solution. We'll release a closed source binary where we've compiled in some keys and some, and some encryption, 
and we won't release the source. If anyone wants to play it, they've got to go through a click-through license on the site that says they, they waive all rights to receive the code under the GPL. Hmm. So this time, um, John did something about it. He released a public statement. Um, the statement had a sort of two-fanged here. He sees both sides of it. The goals are positive. Uh, he's also seen some GPL zealots acting petty and mature. Oh, come on, towards you early on. So he knew people with people's rights to demand code under the GPL, but it isn't necessarily the best attitude to take for all sort of projects. He discussed several possible legal solutions. We proposed half of them because we were working on a competing project that did the same thing, but in a GPL safe way. He doubted that give up your rights click through would hold up in court. And he said he was very happy to pay whatever lawyer the FSF recommended to pursue this. So the project closed and got taken down. And this was a, you know, a, nice, a nice outcome. Uh, and it showed that they did understand the GPL. It's just when it was in their interest to enforce it, which is fine if you're a large commercial company releasing your own code. I personally don't have too many qualms about that sort of thing. Uh, the other thing that IdTech was really good for was research. A lot of people took the open source release and they did awesome things, raycasting, um, all sorts of cool things. So I'm just going to go very quickly and show just a couple of slides here. At LCO 2003 in Perth, Wayne P gave a demonstration of an augmented reality system he was developing under contract with the Department of Defence. Of course, it was based using IdTech 2. How far have we come? So he did tell some tales of trying to get this through airport security, which was very interesting with seeing that backpack go through an x-ray machine with Department of Defense stickers stuck all over it caused quite some concern. It worked quite well. Uh, we were only allowed to use the rubber ducky gun because the defense contracts for the, the real um, tool, that was a $10,000 tool. This rubber ducky gun was $5,000. Yay, defense contracting. Uh, but you know, if these, are, these are things, that this was way back in 2003. So we've come a long way. You know, people are still doing augmented reality stuff in id tech and in tech 2 and in tech 3. But we certainly come a long way in terms of miniaturization and compression. So I had to cut a lot of the meat of this talk. You know, I'm just trying to give you an overview and tell you why you should care about this engine. There are some awesome resources, though, I recommend you look at. The primary one I recommend is Fabian's source code review. Now, Fabian's went through all the tech engines and a bunch of other engines and done a source code review. He's went through, this is how the network layer works. This is how the rendering layer works, and that's a really awesome resource. If you want to play with IdTech, and I do recommend you do if, you know, sure, you can go do your stuff in Unity, but who doesn't want to write some code sometimes? Uh, I recommend looking at Quake Wiki, which has a whole bunch of information on the tooling, Quake C, how the engines worked. If you're interested in the machinima aspect, which was really interesting, I recommend this Den of Geek article, which talks about the very first machinima film, Diary of a Camper and how things sort of went from there. John Carmack's plan files are really interesting reading. So there's several archives of those. There's one there. And the Quake Live files talks about that, um, that guy who decided that a click-through license is a perfectly valid way to evade the GPL. And a whole bunch of um, emails back and forth showing sort of why some people just don't get it. Uh, very interesting reading on Kev Pullo's site there. So that's pretty much all I have to talk about. And apparently I've got two minutes left for any questions. Go for it. Hey, thanks so much. Um, could you off the top of your head um, tell us what you think is the most um, mixture of modern, up-to-date, um, you know, useful, approachable uh, fork of each one of the generations of ID tech into... Sure. So the question was, you know, what's the most modern, up-to-date, approachable version of each engine? For Doom, I'm not too sure, honestly, these days. There are a lot of them out there. PR Boom was one last time I looked, 12 years ago. Um, for id Tech 2, definitely Dark Places, which was by, um, by Forrest Hale, who worked for Valve for a short period of time, and he was a really cool guy I worked with on several projects. So Dark Places had lots of awesome functionality, bringing the engine more into the modern world, including rendering, new scripting stuff, really great engine. 
For IDTEC 3, which is the Quake 3 engine, which is mainly what you're going to look at if you want to do multiplayer stuff, uh, the IO Quake 3 project on Nicholas.org. They've done a lot of work bringing the engine up to date. IO Quake 3, yeah. Everything after that didn't really matter. Uh, IDTEC 4 was the last one, I believe, that was released open source, and that was Doom 3 Quake 4. I call it the rendering a lot of black pixels engine. <laughs> uh, it had lots of cool technology, but... You know, the, the use cases weren't, weren't really there. Like I said, it rendered a lot of really awesome dark lighting in black. Very specific question about um, id Tech uh, 4. 4, sure. Um, so you mentioned that the Doom 3 engine was very, very good at rendering lots of black pixels. Yes. Specifically, one of the reasons why I did that was because of a technique that became known as Carnac's Reverse. And yes. It would actually not render anything if it decided that the volume was, uh, was in a shadow volume. Yes. But that was claimed by, I believe, Nokia in a patent claim. Has that been resolved? That has not been resolved as far as I know. Um, I'm not going to talk about anything involving John Carmack and patents because of dramas in the, in the community and industry at the moment. Um, but yeah, that was indeed done. It was a you know, sort of really intense you know, uh, visibility system where if it was in a shadow volume, it just wouldn't render it, which gave you lots of good performance but got rid of everything. And uh, as was mentioned, that was patented by Nokia. Um, they did raise a bit of a stink, but it's John Carmack. What are you going to do? Um, so that's all we've got time for, so please join me in thanking Ember. Thank you.